Welcome to Grand Prix Toronto. Uh, this is Ben Sek. I'm with Rich Hagen and Jake Van Lunen. Um, we're just starting off with round one, and so we actually have Benson Lay versus Amber Walsh. Right, so uh, Benson Lay is going to be on a burn deck, um, which um, I'm going to run it out there, probably is going to try and be quite aggressive and uh, aim spells at Amber's face. Uh, <laughs> and Amber Walsh, on the other hand, is playing Devoted Company. So that's the matchup. Um, Jake, why don't you walk us through a little bit about these two decks? All right, so Amber's deck is a deck that uses Collected Company to put together a combo that involves Devoted Druid and Vizier of Remedies. Now, with Vizier of Remedies in play, creatures you control may not have minus one, minus one counters put on them. So when you untap a Devoted Druid, you don't have to put the minus one, minus one counter on. So if you get a Devoted Druid that has been in play for a turn and then you're able to cast the Vizier, you can produce infinite green mana. Now. You can then dump that mana into a variety of things. Oftentimes, they're uh, winning the game with Duskwatch Recruiter. It looks like that's what Amber is trying to do here, where you know she cycles through basically her entire deck, eventually finds a Walking Ballista, and with infinite mana, a Walking Ballista can end the game. Um, her opponent, Benson, he's playing Burn. And he, his goal is to reduce Amber's life total from 20 to 0 as quickly as possible. He has a lot of cards that deal damage and... Here we see Searing Blaze, which is going to be one of the most powerful cards in a matchup like this because it not only slows down Amber's deck, but it also advances Benson's goal of dealing damage to Amber. So even though like Benson's deck's called Burn, it obviously has a creature in play. It has a Goblin Guide. Like, how does the, the creatures interact with this, this matchup, or why is it important to the, to the Burn deck? All right, so one thing that's really interesting about a matchup like this is that Oftentimes, you're going to see a burn deck aim virtually all of its burn spells at the opponent's face. Because Benson is playing against a combo strategy that's able to you know, turn around in the game and win the game on the spot, he's going to want to be using his burn spells more aggressively on Amber's creatures, and instead using those burn spells to clear the path for cards like Goblin Guide and or Monastery Swift Sphere to actually get in and uh, you know, deal the damage that he ne so needs to deal to win the game. So. Benson seems to be playing colors other than red, too. Like, he has a, a Sacred Foundry in play as well as a, uh, a Stomping Ground. So why does he ha actually decide to go into other colors? So the major reason to play white is a card called Burrows Charm. And for two mana, it deals four damage to the opponent. It also has other modes. They don't come up nearly as often. But you get a two mana instant. It deals four damage to the opponent. That is an incredible rate for a single card, and uh, it's a major reason to play white. You also get Lightning Helix, which is quite good in the mirror and uh, helps you out in racing situations, especially when you're fighting through your own Eidolon, which we see on the battlefield right now. Um, the green is usually for a card called Atarka's Command, and Atarka's Command deals a disgusting amount of damage for just two mana. So, oh, so, we so, 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 <laughs> like, um, so Amber actually played out um, both a, uh, a Kitchen Finks, a Vizier of, of, of Remedies, and a Viserysir. Viser Viserysir. So yeah. how does that c combination actually, like, Benson scooped up his cards immediately. So what happened there? All right, so here's what happened. Okay, so why don't we do this super slow, okay. and as you say each card, I'll stick it up on the screen. Okay, so where okay. do you want to start? All right, so let's start with Kitchen Finks. Okay, so. Okay. Kitchen Finks. So Kitchen Finks is a one colorless and then two hybrid mana, green-white mana, uh, creature that gains two life when it enters the battlefield and has Persist, which means that when it dies, if it did not have a minus one, minus one counter on it, it returns to the battlefield with a minus one, minus one counter on it and gains you another two life. Um, now let's take a look at um, Vizier of Remedies. Okay. So, Vizier of Remedies says that creatures you control may not have minus one, minus one counters put on them. Therefore, when the Kitchen Finks dies and returns to the battlefield, gaining Amber another two life, it does not return to the battlefield with a minus one, minus one counter on it. So then, we have a Viserysir, which allows us to sacrifice that Kitchen Finks. So it will die and return to the battlefield and gain us two life. Mm -hmm. Each time it returns to the battlefield, it does not have that minus one, minus one counter on it. So Amber can just sacrifice it again, essentially gaining as much life as she'd like to, while also scrying to whatever oh. card she wants to in her deck. Okay, so let me just check. At 917, in round one, 
we get our first reference of the phrase arbitrarily <laughs> large yes. in, refer- yes. in reference to the live title. Um, in case you're wondering what that means at home, you can't just say infinite when you ask, so uh, what life are you going to? Well, it is infinite. No, it isn't. You have to yes. choose an arbitrarily large number. Um, and yeah. so, you yeah, know, like a lot. Yeah, she could have said that, uh, you know, she was at... 20 trillion life. See, I always go for 168 trillion. So at home, <laughs> if you ever play me with this deck, 168 trillion and one, and then you win on life totals. Oh. <laughs> but what if Benson actually had 128 trillion damage in his deck? Yeah, but I had 168. Oh. See, so he'd be 40 trillion short. Unlucky. <laughs> Unlucky Benson. Burn insufficient, apparently. Okay, so that's that's the combo. So you say scry through and keep scrying and keep scrying. So that's look at the top card of the deck, choose where you want to put top or bottom. Mm-hmm. And then goes and finds what? Um, So in that situation, because Amber had an arbitrarily large amount of life, um, she could have won the game however she wanted. And, you know, essentially she creates this uh, combo to actually win the game with Walking Ballista. Okay. So what she would likely want to do is with the infinite mana uh, combo, so she would get a devoted druid. Okay. Uh, then once the devoted druid is in play, well, let's hang on. Let's let's put the devoted druid up because okay. we might see this all again and yes. it, and again. It's <laughs> blisteringly fast and it's early. So uh, there's devoted druid. Okay. So we're putting the minus one counter on, but it can't. Yes. So so that's the infinite map. We just go tap and tap, tap and tap, tap and tap. Um, d- is there a shortcut for this on Magic Online, or do you have to do it every time you want the mana? You have to do it every time you want uh, the mana. Oh, good. Yeah, it, Good. you still lose to it all the time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> mind you. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's quite powerful. PV uh, beat me not too long ago playing this deck. So. Okay, so now <laughs> now we have our infinite mana. We've got we've gained arbitrarily large life. We've got infinite mana. Can yes. you have infinite mana, or do you have to have arbitrarily large mana? Arbitrarily large mana. Okay. Once again. Okay. <laughs> so with our arbitrarily large mana, we then sink it all in. Well, half of it into the X and half of it into the other X. <laughs> Correct. On walking ballista. So. It, so Walking Ballista is now arbitrarily large. Yes. It's, it's basically the, the two X's. No, it's, it's half arbitrarily large. Arbi- yeah. So it's arbitrarily, arbitrarily large over two. La- <laughs> <laughs> and a really good something like that. Yeah. Approximately. Yes. Half a Google. Half. Mm. That, that's, that's a bit complex for me. Or a Googleplex, as I like to think of it. So, um, we're back in action. Um, here comes round number two. Hope you all understood that at home. I certainly didn't. Uh, so, uh, here we go with... Is that a Rift Bolt being suspended over there? It, it is. Um, so, it's, it's really important for for modern players in general to actually use all their mana every turn because it's, it's such a, a, a format of inches. And so... Um, like being able to use your your mind on turn one, like by like suspending a rift bolt, really really allows you to kind of get ahead of your your opponent, and in this case actually could disrupt Amber by killing her noble hierarch. Yeah, now an interesting uh, choice by Benson here because Benson is going to be constantly faced with the decision between whether or not he wants to aim his burn spells directly at Amber or at the creatures that Amber plays, and it seems like Benson is deciding that he wants to prioritize. Uh, killing the creatures that Amber puts on the battlefield. And in doing so, he's slowing himself down a lot and giving her an opportunity to get to a later stage of the game where her deck will have the advantage with cards like Kitchen Finks. Um, This is a difficult decision for Benson. I think that killing Amber's creatures is likely the correct line when he's applying pressure with creatures of his own. But if he does not have any creatures on the battlefield, then every time he kills one of her creatures, he's essentially allowing her to gain three life with that creature that she played. And her deck becomes a pile of healing solves, which is just a nightmare for Benson. Healing salve being gain three life. The yes. slightly less played <laughs> um, part of the cycle than lightning bolt. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, so one of the things that, that happened in the early turns was uh, Amber played a Noble Harak. And... There's kind of a, a saying that a lot of players who've been playing for a, a long time say, bolt the bird. Do you think that like in this kind of matchup, that's that's the way that you should be playing it? Like, is the noble hike so important to Amber's like combination that it, it deserves a lot of heat? Um, I don't think it's necessarily as important as it might be traditionally. I think 
a lot of decks, when they play a turn one bird and you're playing the burn deck, you're going to want to kill that bird because it's going to ramp them into four or five drops that are very difficult for you to beat and or race. However, if her deck is more of a combo strategy. So perhaps he wants to use his burn spells on particular combo pieces and in, use excess burn spells to actually win the game. A uh, little bit of report from our um, text writer um, on coverage this weekend, Corbin Hostler. He says both Amber and Benson are Canadian. They're Amber's local. Uh, Benson's about a four-hour drive away. And both are playing in their first ever GP. Fantastic. Getting a round one feature match for your first like, 100, GP. 100% yeah. feature match. Just live in there. <laughs> So, so actually, directly in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, one of the ways I, I guess Burn kind of like tries to play both ways of killing creatures and and uh, also advancing their strategy is using spells like Searing Blood and Searing Blaze. Like, how important is is it to draw those cards in this matchup? Oh, those are far and away the best cards in Benson's deck in a matchup like this. Uh, with Searing Blood or Searing Blaze, Benson is not only able to get Amber's permanence off the battlefield, but also, uh, he's able to reduce her life total all in one card. Okay, so um, Amber's now playing Collected Company. This is a card that like dominated standard for a while. Um, you know, it, how like how does that really in interact with her her cards and combo? So, all of Amber's combo pieces cost three or less mana, meaning that Collected Company can often find two combo pieces for just one card at at a very good mana rate, uh, making it far and away the most powerful card in Amber's deck. Amber got very unlucky there, and despite her deck having a, a tremendous number of creatures that cost three or less mana, the only creatures she saw with the Collected Company were Vizier of Remedies and a Walking Ballista, which would enter the battlefield with no plus one, plus one counters. So even though Amber is like a, you know, a combo deck, we saw that in game one, I mean, does she have a, a plan B if all her creatures get killed? I mean, how, how, do, how does... How do you deal with like a deck that has it's essentially all removal? Um, so you can make the game go longer, and you can find incremental advantages if your opponent is using a lot of removal spells by using cards like Eternal Witness and or Tireless Tracker. And bit of Kitchen Finks thrown in here and there for some life gain and uh, yes. essentially undoing one burn spell. Correct. And those, those cards are very good at grinding an opponent out who's using removal spells. Uh, Eternal Witness in particular, you know, it will present two cards for a single card. Uh, Tireless Tracker, if you play land and then perhaps have another land which you can sacrifice to find another land, that creates a lot of extra cards for your opponent to deal with. I've got to say, gents, this is a very disappointing format. I thought Modern was meant to be interesting and interactive and fun. And look, all there is is just like nine lands on the table. <laughs> and like some of them are even basic. What's going on? Well, they're one. They're pretty cool basic ones. And <laughs> and fair, fair. <laughs> that is a very good flavor point. Uh, but two, actually, I mean, there's actually really interesting lands in play with uh, Gavany Township. Um, also, another card that helps you grind the game. Yeah, and Gavany Township in a long game will provide a, a really strong advantage, especially alongside Kitchen Finks, where it can give it uh, an opportunity to persist once again. Uh, here, a much better collected company for Amber, uh, choosing to take a Devoted Druid and a Kitchen Finks instead of a Kitchen Finks and a Sin Collector. So, so Benzer just played uh, Skullcrack. Um, one of his tools to actually kind of combat some of what's happening on the board. Like, how does Skullcrack work in, in that strategy? So, Amber was hoping to gain two life when that Kitchen Fink centered the battlefield, but because Benson was able to cast that Skullcrack, it means that Amber was not able to gain life on that turn, and instead of going up to 11, uh, she took three damage and did not gain two life, so she fell to six, and that's a dangerous place to be against a burn deck where so many of their cards deal three damage. So, so Amber just played Vizio of Remedies. Um, now, we, we talked about the infinite combo. Uh, Amber has technically the infinite combo in play. I think Benson is thinking about doing something. Um, like, how does, you know, not to get too, like, technical, but how does the timing work with this stuff? Can, can he disrupt it? So here's the thing. Um, if... <laughs> yeah, that, so that's the sound <laughs> effect, by the way, of, of arbitrarily large mana getting created. Yeah, so if Benson wants to prevent the combo from happening, he could have killed the Devoted Druid in response to the Vizier uh, entering the battlefield. So while the Vizier was on the stack, as they say. Um, but 
he allowed the vizier to resolve, meaning that he believes Amber does not have the necessary combo pieces to win the game here. And it looks like it <laughs> looks like, like he's, he's correct. He's correct. Because I, I think I saw a burn spell that actually could have could could have hit the the vizier. In fact, he's going to cast it right now. He's cast the searing blaze. I think it's probably targeting probably the vizier, but could be the devoted druid. Yeah, and I believe I saw a lightning bolt in his hand as well, and that's going to be six damage. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh wow! So Amber there. Uh, creating enough mana with that devoted druid to uh, activate the Gavany Township along with the Temple Garden there, but... Not relevant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Benson showed the two burn spells that were in his hand. Amber is on six and also zero the next turn. Okay, so um, welcome along. Uh, if you're just joining us here at Grand Prix Toronto, I'm Rich Hagen. Um, this is the voice of Ben Sek. Hello. And this is the voice of Jacob Van Lunen. How are you? <laughs> and we are together bringing you MTG Launch. It's the first of our six shows this weekend. And if you're thinking the tone is a little bit different than maybe you're used to, the first couple of rounds of each GP, we're going to go out of our way just a little bit to kind of dial some of the, the super deep dive stuff um, away. And just particularly for people who are new to coverage or new to modern or new to particular decks, just to go through what some of the key decks do um, through the first couple of rounds. So when later this afternoon, afternoon, um, you have Jake and TBS talking away about the devoted company decks and the great lines that the best pros in the world are making. You've seen the combo, and you understand that when the opponent is just sweeping up their permanents just because a Viscera Seer has appeared on the battlefield, we've taken the time to explain why. Um, and that's the goal with the first couple of rounds, um, and of course, um, all the high-level stuff coming your way um, as the day progresses. Rounds three through six of the pro show. Um, we've got Riley Knight and Eduardo Sanchgalic coming along for rounds three and five at TBS, and Jake will be here for rounds four and six. And then it'll be the cut, rounds seven and eight. The best matches at five and one to see who's in today two with six wins, and the best elimination matches at five and two. That's the eight rounds that come your way today. But right now, you're watching MTG Launch. And here is Ben Sec. Yeah, so, so Devoted Company, I mean, how popular is this deck? I, I saw a, maybe a little bit of the Pro Tour. Like, is it a mainstay or is it something new? I, I know Burn's been around for, you know, eons. Devoted Company uh, became a deck once Vizier of Remedies was printed, and uh, a lot of people tried to play with it. It was kind of heralded as maybe the, the new big deck in modern when it was first discovered, but uh, the format has changed over the last few months and at times was more hostile toward uh, creature-based combo strategies. And as a result, the deck has become quite a lot less pow uh, popular. Uh, I still think it is one of the more powerful decks in the format, and even if a lot of pros didn't end up bringing it to the Pro Tour, I think that uh, this is a deck that's going to be around for quite some time in Modern. Okay, so this is game three. Amber's on the play this time. She opens with a, a Bird of Paradise. Is it like really, really important to get like a, a mana creature on board on, on turn one for, for, for this deck? Um, I think that Amber's deck wants to accelerate into her, her like powerful cards and wants to be able to do things. So having a turn one bird, very good, but not as important as it might be if she was a deck that was playing a whole bunch of cards that cost four and five mana. And just to clarify something you said earlier, uh, Ben, the Birds of Paradise is where Bolt the Bird comes from. That is the bird that gets bolted. Okay, so Vincent didn't actually bolt it. No. He played a Grim Lava Mancer, which maybe is actually better in this situation. What do you think, Jake? Yeah, so Grim Lava Mancer uh, has traditionally been one of the absolute best cards against these green creature decks, especially green creature decks that play cards like Birds of Paradise. The thing about Grim Lava Mancer is that it provides you with a repeatable removal spell. So for just one red mana, you can tap the Grim Lava Mancer, remove two cards in your graveyard from the game, and then kill one of your opponent's creatures by dealing two damage to it. And those cards in the burn deck's graveyard are irrelevant for the burn deck. The burn deck isn't going to use them for anything else. So every two cards or every land that gets sacrificed plus another card that Benson has represents another removal spell for one of Amber's creatures. So in terms of like Grim Lava Mancer in Limited, 
you didn't often get to activate it because mostly, you know, you didn't want your creatures to die. You weren't running lots of spells. And then as you worked your way up the chain, in standard you could do it a bit. And is modern in, in a sort of overpowered place? Is, is there a, just a limitless resource for, for Grim Lava Mancer? Or is it still quite hard worked to get enough cards in the graveyard for it to be a, a machine gun, if you like? It's not quite unlimited, but it is much more like a machine gun than it has been in other formats where Grim Lava Mancer has seen play. Uh, Grim Lava Mancer has seen some fringe play in Legacy, where it essentially just, you know, taps with a red mana to deal two damage to something. But here, it is likely that Benson will be able to use that at will at least three or four times. Okay. I think in the face of the Grim Lava Mancer, Emma might decide to change strategies, obviously. Like, the combo is harder to put into play because, you know, Benson has almost infinite, um, like, fodder for, for his Grim Lava Mancer. So how would you approach this situation? I, it looks like Amber doesn't actually have something to get rid of the Grim Lava Mancer, like a Path to Exile or anything like that. W what's the strategy now? Um, so if you're Amber, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe I can get Benson to play a reactive game and I can beat him by playing more powerful creatures. And you kind of, in many ways, have to hope that Benson's draw is somewhat lackluster, that he has card, a lot of cards like Skullcrack and Burrow's Charm that can't actually kill her creatures uh, in conjunction with that Grim Lava Mancer. So, I mean, Grim Lava Mancer is a nightmare for her if she cannot get it off the battlefield. It's really hard for her to change her game plan in such a way that that game plan is not super susceptible to a card like Grim Lava Mancer. It's basically what her deck does is play creatures that have one or two toughness. <laughs> that's her whole deck. Though she does have a Kitchen Finks in play that happens to be beating down pretty well so far. Uh, actually, it's the Sync Collector, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's a Sync Collector. So it sounds like yeah. uh, we might need to stop that. There's an issue. Yeah, that looks like they are on top of that now. The issue with the mana. Yeah, mana not work on that. You can't cast that. You are correct, chat. Um, so they're, they're going back by the looks of things down there. Okay. So instead of casting the Sync Collector, which she didn't quite have the mana for, she decides to go to Vizio Remedies. Which she does. In the uh, Vizio Remedies, not long for this world. Uh, Grim Lama Mancer can pick that off quite easily. Uh, though it does force Benson to aim that two damage at something other than the Kitchen Finks. And currently turns off Grim Lava Mancer because there's only one card left in the graveyard. That's correct. Yep. Though with that Bloodstained Mire, again, Benson won't have difficulty activating the Grim Lava Mancer. But Ember right now is like at a pretty healthy 16 life. Um, the the Kitchen Finks is still in play, doesn't actually have a persist counter on it or, or anything like, like that. So, and Benson's on 11. I, is he in trouble of like falling behind? Um, I don't believe so. I think Grim Lava Mancer is powerful enough that it allows him to have a very dominating control game plan. You know, when we first came into this match, we thought about it as Benson being the aggressor and Amber mm. wanting the game to go longer so that she could assemble these combo pieces or these more powerful cards. But with a card like Grim Lava Mancer on the battlefield, Benson can adapt his game plan and become the more controlling deck. And it becomes very difficult for him to lose because of that incremental advantage that he's gaining over the course of the game. Right. This might be a, a conversation for after the match, but uh, in a sense, what we're talking about there is the idea, it's like assignment of roles. And it's the idea that at any given time, someone should be trying to win and someone should be trying to not lose. And when you correctly identify which of those two you are meant to be, you have a very good chance, a much better chance of eventually claiming the three points. Correct. So, Benson <laughs> fetching a land which helps him fuel his Grim Lava Manta, probably to start uh, maybe eating into the Kitchen Finks so he doesn't take as much damage. No, but he decides to play Skullcrack. And by playing that Skullcrack, uh, he ensures that when he does kill this Kitchen Finks with the Grim Lava Mancer, Amber will not be gaining two life from the Persist ability there. It's good sequencing by Benson. So the Finks is back. 
Tireless Tracker and a Horizon Canopy by Amber. So Amber will get a clue here. Uh, currently, the Tireless Tracker does only have two toughness. So it's, I imagine, quite likely that uh, on Benson's turn, we're going to see that die to either Rift Bolt or an activation of Grim Lava Mancer after the Rift Bolt kills something. Looks like... Uh, it Benson looks like Benson accidentally drew his card right. before using the Rift Bolt. Er. Yeah. So a reminder um, that not only is this uh, the first match of their GP, this is their first ever Grand Prix match uh, for both of them. Incidentally, uh, someone asked in chat, how do we choose feature matches um, early in the tournament? Because, of course, we don't know what people are playing. We haven't had a chance to look at thousands of deck lists. Um, well, we tried something a bit different for this show. We thought, well, in the top eight, tables one, two, three, and four will be the last four tables paired for the quarterfinals. So we thought, what would tables one, two, three, and four look like 36 hours earlier? This is table one. This is literally the first thing on the pairings board um, for this tournament. And eventually, on this exact camera at this exact table, presumably, both of Benson Lai and Amber Walsh will be replaced, though not 100% definitely, by the two finalists. Um, so we just went with one, two, three, and four, and thought, okay, let's just start from the top and see how long it takes to get your eventual winner um, up there um, as Benson continues to apply the pressure. Yep, so uh, though Benson missed the trigger, actually the way that the ruling worked uh, from the floor is uh, that Amber was actually allowed to choose whether she wanted the trigger on and off. And uh, she decided that you know, she'll allow uh, Benson to actually have that trigger. Just wanted to keep the, the tone of the game very, very friendly. Awesome. Okay, so Amber actually responds with a Sin Collector. Um, I think that gets to nab a Lightning Helix. Now Amber is actually out of creatures. The Grim Lava Mancer has finally taken his toll on Amber's board. Yeah, and we've watched this Grim Lava Mancer just be a dominant force over the course of this game. Okay, so Benson gets one of his repeatable sources of damage with Monaster Monastery Swiss Spear. Which is a bit of a mouthful, to be <laughs> fair. Okay. So Amber actually chooses to pass. She actually has a collected company in hand, which is obviously an instant, so she actually gets to almost kind of surprise Benson with it. Oh but it looks like this is big trouble. Yeah. yeah so like Amber falls to two from the lightning bolt, and she, but she can go down to one here by casting Collected Company. And when Benson tries to use his uh, Grim Lava Mancer to deal two, she was looking for Kitchen Finks, which right. would allow her to be at one, and that would not only be able to block the Monastery Swift Spear, but it would also you know, keep her alive. She was unable to find the correct combination of cards, though, and uh, Benson is able to get the match. Okay, so uh, that is our first match uh, been and gone. Um, now, we have a sort of small team here at Toronto, so we don't have quite as many options as uh, we would like to. Um, but I am hoping that there is a table two still going. It looks like there is. It's Ji Kun Lu um, against Alexander Miller. It's Jeskai Control against Storm. And currently, a bunch of lands, lots of Scalding Tons, uh, and um, a very pretty... I don't... It doesn't quite look Japanese... Um, I wonder if that's one of the, like, the Korean yeah. um, Snapcaster Mages. But in any case, it is a Snapcaster Mage. So here we go um, with the deciding action. We're live in round one on MTG Launch. Here's Ben Sek and Jacob Van Loon. So Jeskai Control and Storm, definitely pillars of, of the modern like format. Um, Storm obviously utilizes the, the, the Storm mechanic. We'll go through that in a second. Um, and Jeskai Control. I mean... We talked about aggro decks being really, really good. What the hell is this? All right, so Jeskai Control is a deck that really preys on aggressive creature decks mostly by playing a lot of removal spells and then ways to gain advantage uh, in the form of Snapcaster Mage in particular. Um, it's very good at applying pressure with uh, creatures of its own in the form of things like Snapcaster Mage, sometimes Geist of Saint Trap, sometimes Vendillion Click. And... Uh, it aims to end the game quickly by throwing burn spells at the opponent's face in the late game, but it controls the game early by using counter magic and removal spells. Uh, in a matchup like this, uh, especially in the first game, the Jeskai control deck finds itself really up against the wall because 
the Storm deck can kind of take as much time as it wants to sculpt a perfect hand and uh, make it really, really difficult for the Jeskai control deck to have the correct set of answers to line up to the very complex question that the Storm deck will be asking. So, so on the right-hand side, uh, Alexander Miller's playing Storm. Um, it may look like he has two extra land in play. That's actually not... Uh, <laughs> not exactly true. Um, Indeed, like it's exactly <laughs> not true. <laughs> uh, so, so what Storm does is it actually tries to generate like bunches of mana, and sometimes mm -hmm. you you have some of the floating in the pool. So um, Alec, Alec is using like a, the mountain and the island to just represent how much mana is in this pool, as well as that face down card, which is a storm count. So, actually, bef before I go into some of that, how does this deck work, Jake? Okay, so what Alexander Miller wants to do is he wants to cast a whole lot of spells on one turn. Uh, he's able to do that because a lot of the spells he's casting produce mana themselves. So they allow him to continue casting more spells. Once he's able to cast a whole bunch of spells, he will often use a card like Past in Flames. And what Past in Flames does is it allows him to cast cards from his graveyard as if they had flashback. Then he's able to cast a whole bunch more spells. And eventually, a lot of the spells that he has allow him to draw cards. Those cards are able to find him a card called Grape Shot. And Grape Shot copies itself for each spell that had been played previously that turn. And he will use Grape Shot to deal lethal damage to his opponent. Uh, in post-boarded games, he can adapt his deck to have other storm spells. Sometimes cards like Empty the Warrens to make tons of goblins. Just a really, really powerful combo deck. So... What Alex, like, sorry, the, the Storm deck, historically, you know, used to be just a lot of spells. Mm -hmm. And one of the innovations, I think, that's happened in the last year or so is the addition of a, a new card from, or well, not new, but new in that deck, um, Gifts Ungiven. So how does Gifts Ungiven kind of interact with this whole combo deck? So the fact that Gifts Ungiven can uh, put a card called Past in Flames, either in your hand or your graveyard, Past in Flames has flashback, which is very important. Uh, means that Gifts Ungiven will often find you two pieces you need to combo off or one piece you need to combo off and the requisite uh, card to allow you to get over that hill to actually kill your opponent. Um, Gifts Ungiven becomes especially powerful because you're playing it with a card called Baral uh, and a card called Goblin Electromancer. The fact that you're able to play Gifts Ungiven for just three mana means that you are then able to find rituals that only cost one, and uh, it really just snowballs out of control. Okay, so it looks like uh, Alexander's maybe trying to storm off here. He's, he's cast a Paretic Ritual. And... But then he tried... Uh, but that was actually negated by mm. Ji Kun Lu, who's quite... Putting a little bit of pressure on, on Alex with like his Vidalian click and very, very cool looking Snapcaster Mage. So he uh, oh, yeah. So this is this is the classic defensive grape shot, isn't it? This is like, I'd yes. like to clear the board and let's, <laughs> let's just make this game go a lot longer than it's currently about to. Yeah, so because there had been uh, spells cast previously, the grape shot copied itself and the Snapcaster Mage and Vidalian click both have one toughness and as a result, uh, Alex was able to just wipe Lou's board L there. A little bit vulnerable, we could say. <laughs> yes. So, so Jake and Lou uh, used his uh, Relic of Progenitus, which almost definitely came in from the sideboard. Um, as we talked before, like Past and Flames interacts with the graveyard, so he probably had that there to kind of defend against that. Um, but, you know, felt that didn't, he didn't need that graveyard removal. Like, do, how much does the graveyard removal, you know, interact with the the Storm Deck doesn't need the graveyard? Uh, so Storm Deck can go off without its graveyard. It doesn't need it. However, it's a lot easier uh, when you do have access to your graveyard and have access to Pass in Flames, which is, you know, just incredibly powerful. So um, when you're able to take the Storm opponent's graveyard away from them, it's kind of like they're riding a bike with training wheels and you just kick the training wheels off their bike. And you make it a lot harder for them to go off uh, you make the game more complicated for them, and you know, sometimes that's a good route to victory, especially when you're able to apply pressure. An exclusive, hard-won piece of knowledge for you. There is no such card in Gatherer as Steam V-Nuts. 
<laughs> Just want you to know that. Just, no, no, couldn't find it anywhere. Well, there should be, really. Well, yeah. <laughs> now, there is this card. That's a pretty version of that card. It's, it's, it is a very pretty version of that card, for sure. Now, there's Baral. There we go. But uh, Jikun basically doesn't want Baral in play because a lot of times the control deck wants to kind of constrain the mana of Alex, especially when he's uh, land screwed. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's important to note just how powerful Goblin Electromancer and Baral Chief of Compliance are in the Storm deck. Uh, the Storm deck is playing a lot of ritual cards, so cards that, you know, cost two mana, but then produce three mana, cards like Pyretic Ritual. And when you have a Baral, Chief of Compliance, or Goblin Electromancer in play, those cost a single red mana and produce three red mana. So they become, you know, red dark rituals, if you will. And dark ritual being one of the most powerful cards from, you know, alpha and beta. Um, so these, uh, these cards all become incredibly powerful and you're able to, you know, just cast them at will and suddenly have an arbitrarily a large amount of mana which will allow you to give some given for tons of shiny toys and you know f just cast all of your spells through any amount of cryptic commands that your opponent might have cryptic command costs four mana that's really only going to give you one piece of disruption when you're fighting against a storm deck so one of the things about like storm is um whenever you actually storm off and you like create all those copies on the stack uh a control deck actually has to counter every one of them stack if it actually wants to like stop the grape, grape shot. So obviously it's not the best way for the control deck to attack the grape shot. How do you think like Jeskai Control should actually attack, um, and how should it go about its, its its match against Storm? So it's important for Jeskai Control to have a threat on the battlefield while they're trying to constrain the combo storm deck. Like that Vendillion click and that Snapcaster Mage, which is why the Grape Shot was such a big deal. Absolutely. Um, however, uh, if you are trying to interact specifically with the combo, uh, it's often correct to counter the first or second ritual effect or the Past and Flames. Those become the most important cards to counter. And because you don't want the opponent to snowball out of control with too much mana for you to deal with, or you don't want them to have the the big flashy finish. Okay, I, I have to intro yeah. you because this will never happen again. We have three birds, actual live birds, sitting on the rail about 15 feet from the commentary booth, which means the sound you can hear in your ears of real birds, yep, that's actually happening in the room. Yeah, rail birds, if you will. R oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, how did I not see that? I thought that's where it was going. You're very good. <laughs> wow. Don't bolt those birds. Don't don't bolt the bird. No, we get into lots of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so Alexander tried to cast a Metamorphose. Uh Jikun actually wanted to cast his Cryptic Command, which was actually attempted to be countered again by Alex with a remand, and then uh, you can basically stop it with a Logic Knot. So they fought over a card that doesn't look like it does much. I mean, Metamorphose, you know, all it does is replace the mana it was used to cast it and draw a card, so almost nothing happens there. Why was there a fight against that card? So that, that's kind of what we just talked about earlier, where you, you either want to counter the first card or the Past and Flames. Um, you don't want to let the storm deck get out of hand with the amount of mana that it has access to because then suddenly they're able to do more than you're able to counter or interact with and that creates some big problems for you so the reappearance of the storm uh storm card back if you like plus the blue and the red mana we're up to three red mana there so here comes pyretic ritual part de so Jikun decides to Cryptic Command the second ritual, eschewing uh, what you were saying a bit earlier, yeah. but it does actually strand him, like, you know, with only one red mana. Now casting the Gifts Ungiven, but Jikun's having no none of that and decides to Logic Knot. Yeah, and at this point, Jikun has enough mana where he can allow that first ritual to respond and essentially get 
two cards out of Miller's hand for that one counter spell because he's still going to have extra counter magic up. Um, you know, had Jeekin not had this amount of mana in play, then when Alexander, you know, cast that gifts ungiven, it would have been able to resolve. But Jeekin now is at the stage of the game where he can just, you know, let things go in that way, so, if you will. So, so g given we are at a point where the just guy controlled player has seven land out. It's like well established. Do we think that you know Jikun has an advantage in this situation? Absolutely. This is over, isn't it? Just about. Um, I don't think it's quite as over as it might have been for Storm decks of old. Okay. Um, you know, it, it used to be that the, if the Storm deck had less than four cards left in their hand and you were a control deck, the game was essentially just over. But because of how powerful Pass and Flames is, uh, if Alexander is able to just power through the card past in flames, uh, then he'll be able to win the game, but it really just hinges on whether or not he finds a window to resolve that card with mana remaining in his mana pool. To show that I pay attention to you, Jake, uh, you talked about a threat on the Jeskai control side. We've just seen Celestial Colonnade come down uh, for Jeek and Lou, and that is potentially how that's going to win three turns or four turns from now, uh, if he decides he wants to spend the mana. So Jigen yeah. just doesn't want anything on Alex's side. Like, it's, I think he's cast his third cryptic of the game, um, countering the gifts ungiven. And now, as Rich mentioned, decided he needs to turn the corner, attacks, and animates with his colonnade, and plays another one. Yeah, and it's interesting there, because Alex uh, went for that gifts ungiven during his own turn, it looked like. And... Uh, you know, had he waited, maybe if he had gotten Lou to attack with that colonnade, he might have been able to uh, find an opening where Lou's mana was constrained a little more. So I think Alex is deciding that he needs to really end the game pretty soon because he's only at seven. Those colonnades are hitting for four a turn. So he went, goes for a desperate ritual. A desperation play. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I haven't seen that art before, Rich. Yeah, um, it is from Dual Decks, Mind versus Might, apparently. But let's let's cut to this next card because this one's important. So, Pass yes. and Flames, uh, cast by Alex Miller, and but you can just a handful of counter spells here negates it. But it is in the graveyard, ready to be flashback. Mm -hmm. is, is there still a chance for Alex here? Or, or, or I don't think so because it, G can loot not only now to see this colony that attacks for four. But uh, his deck also plays Lightning Bolts, and he hasn't had many targets for those. It's likely he has one in hand. <laughs> the game could just end right here. Yeah, and more counter spells, and here's a Lightning Bolt, and then I'm going to untap, and then I'm going to Celestial Colonnade you, and thanks for playing, Storm Guy. Jess Guy Control takes it. Yeah, no, I mean, that was actually a, a really, really cool matchup to, to, to watch. I mean, it really shows all the, like, I mean, we've seen a bunch of decks. We've seen a combo kind of creature deck, then we've seen a burn deck, then we've seen a combo spell deck and then a control deck. I mean, like, this is really showing the diversity of, of modern. And actually, we have yet another archetype um, in the feature match area, Affinity, now playing against Jeskai Control, which we j just saw. Like, so, you know, like, what's Affinity's place in the modern minigame? Uh, we talked a little bit about Affinity in the pregame. And Affinity can, you want to empty your hand as quickly as possible, apply as much pressure on the opponent as you can, and just end the game quickly. It's a super aggressive deck. Uh, you have t a whole bunch of cards that can just exit your hand immediately, uh, provide you with a whole bunch of artifacts in the battlefield, and then you have 12 cards that really matter a lot. Those cards are Cranial Plating, Steel Overseer, and Arcbound Ravager. Um, if you're playing against Affinity, your number one goal is to keep those 12 cards off of the battlefield. If you're able to do that, then the Affinity deck some, seems a little weak, even in the modern metagame. Um, however, if even a single copy of those 12 cards is able to resolve and get on the battlefield, it often feels completely hopeless. And you're going to need to interact on multiple avenues to beat any single one of those cards. So if Affinity's known kind of as some people term it as a linear deck. What, what does that really mean? Like, look, how, how, does that, how does that play into how people react to it and how people play with it? Um, so it's an aggressive deck. So if you're able to take the wind out of their sails, you're putting yourself in a really good position. The Affinity deck does have staying power in the form of lands that can become creatures. Um, 
Ink Moth Nexus in particular is able to end games by itself out of nowhere in conjunction with something like an Arcbound Ravager or Cranial Plating. That happened to us last night. We <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, 10 poison on an t- unfortunate turn. But uh, the Affinity deck, as long as you're able to fill your deck with a lot of spot removal, a lot of cheap removal cards, and some artifact removal, that should be your game plan. And uh, because of that, it makes Affinity a deck that's pretty easy to beat if you want to beat it. However, there was a lot of affinity of there was not a lot of affinity last weekend at the Pro Tour. There has not been a lot of affinity in recent modern events on Magic Online. People may be cutting the hate from affinity out of their decks and that can make affinity pretty powerful again. Wait a second. Isn't there an artifact deck that won the Pro Tour? Doesn't that yeah. count for something? It doesn't matter that there wasn't a lot of affinity. There was a Pro Tour winning deck that was artifact 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 artifact. Surely that matters. See, the thing about Modern, though, is I don't think you can really overwhelm your sideboard with cards to beat a deck like Lantern when, you know, even though Lantern won the Pro Tour, if you want to play Lantern in a tournament like a Grand Prix, you're going to need to play 100 matches with Lantern before you show up to the Grand Prix. You're going to need to find these really obscure cards, and you need to be the type of human who wants to play a Lantern deck. So... Despite Lantern having won the Pro Tour just last weekend, I think it's unlikely that even 5% of the room will be playing a deck like Lantern this weekend. So Matthew Scherer, um, he mulliganed turn one, so he, he didn't have as explosive a turn um, as he could have on turn one, only casting a Vault Scourge and an Ornithopter. But he's making up for it on turn two with a Mox Opal and a Cradle Plating. But hmm. no, John George having none of it. Yeah, Ceremonious Rejection there, a really nice one-mana answer to one of those powerful two-mana cards that uh, Matthew Scherer's deck presents. Rejection. (laughs) Above the rim, no, get out of here. Hold on, Matthew Scherer just played a non-artifact card. Like, that doesn't seem like it would be, you know, normally in Affinity. Like, like why is Thoughtseize, like, hanging out in uh, the Affinity deck? Um, So Thoughtseize allows you to take the key cards out of your opponent's hands so that you can run them over, essentially. Now, Matthew Sherrod not presenting a whole lot of damage here just yet, only attacking for one, but he just left John George with a hand of a card that cost four mana and a card that cost five mana. Urgh. And that means that Matthew Shera on this following turn is likely going to do something pretty powerful, I imagine. Thoughtseize is likely to be coming out of the, the board of... Affinity. It's not really a main deck card, right? Uh, I think so. I, I think that it's hard to justify playing cards that are not part of your well-oiled machine, if you will, in the first game. You want 60 out of 60 of your cards to all advance yourself toward one particular goal, and that goal usually does not involve inru- disrupting your opponent. Matthew Shearer gets down cranial plating, adds it to his Vault Scourge, does the little hand dance around the table as he counts up the artifacts and then goes, five, um, because that's the punchline to this. Um, (laughs) And uh, John George goes down 10, and Matthew Shearer goes up to 23. So this is a dangerous spot for, like, the Jeskai Control deck. I mean, as you said, one of the important 12 cards got onto the table. It's already taken a big chunk of John George's life. I mean, like, so how does... Like, Jessica Control kind of, like, come back from a situation like this. It, it, I mean, Master Sherry is set up. He has only one card in hand, but he has a lot of power in play. Um, as we said before, like, Thoughtseize took all the cheap cards out of uh, John George's hand. So what does John hope to do right now? So John's deck is actually quite strong in this matchup because he has so much inexpensive removal in his deck. We talked about how he doesn't have any of that left right now, but he does have a Cryptic Command, which he's going to be able to cast this turn. And that's going to give him the draw off the Cryptic Command, plus two more draw steps to find instant speed spot removal that can either kill the creatures that the Cranial Plating is attached to, or in some cases kill the Cranial Plating itself, uh, if he's able to find a piece of artifact removal. And it looks like he did so. Yeah, I spy with my little eye two cards that are one card, wear tear, um, really epitomizing the, the cheap removal that you, you were talking about before. So, so what, like, how does wear tear, like, you know, why is Jeskai Control playing a wear tear and, you know, how, why is it good versus affinity? So the fact that you get to just point at an artifact and get it off of the battlefield uh, for just two mana, that's a great deal. Just uh, the uh, shatter effect is wonderful. It is a, you know, terminate 
that also kills cards like cranial plating, and that's just tremendous. Uh, like that, in mm. fact. Yes. As John George will now demonstrate for <laughs> us. <laughs> I think that cranial plating was wearing thin on him. <laughs> Yeah, now John George looks to be in a pretty commanding position here, especially having just drawn a Snapcaster Mage. That Snapcaster Mage is oh, wow. going to be another artifact removal spell with the Wear Terror that's in his graveyard. Um, and he even has a Cryptic Command in his hand, so if Matthew Scherer is able to find another powerful artifact, John George could simply counter it. Now, you know, in a lot of these control games, there's always a moment where, you know, we, we, we say the game kind of, like, turns a corner. So, so are we at that corner now? Is John George like taking over the game? I think so. I think I think we were at that corner when John George drew the wear tear. Mm -hmm. um, that you know made a huge difference in this game. And uh, suddenly, instead of John George trying to you know tread water and keep his head above, he instead was you know starting to tear apart Matthew Shera's offensive game plan. Uh, before he was able to take the game over with the powerful spells that he has in hand, like Cryptic Command and. Uh, the big Jace. And once those are, you know, deployed, it, they're a lot more powerful than the cards Matthew's presenting. Okay, so, so what is Matt Scherer hoping to, to draw now? Like, what, what does he need? You know, he obviously needs a few things to go right. What are the cards that he can draw? What, like, how does Affinity come back from his back in these situations? Um, so Affinity has Galvanic Blast, usually. And, um, he, Matthew Scherer could hypothetically resolve a pair of Galvanic Blast uh, over the course of an end step in a main phase if John George is tapping out for things. Uh, that would be one route to victory. Uh, but that's really what Matthew Scherer needs. It's going to be really hard for Matthew Scherer to win via attacking at this point. Okay, so we cast Arkband Ravager, but the perfect answer in the form of Spell Snare. Yeah, and uh, Spell Snare, it's important to know, is one of the very best cards in this matchup. Uh, we talked about the 12 really powerful cards that are in Affinity, the Steel Overseers, the Arcbound Ravagers, and the Cranial Platings, uh, the cards that you really need to deal with. All of those cost two mana. So if you have access to Spell Snare in your sideboard or in your main deck, uh, remember, it is one of the very best cards you could have against a deck like Affinity. Okay. John Jones plays Jace Memory Ad Adept. <laughs> so, so this is... Kind of an unusual card to see in, in, in modern. Like, obviously, like a, a powerful card. It has the word Jace on its name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, you know, what's 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 the purpose of a, of a card like this? I mean, this is a five mana card. There's not that many five mana cards that don't have a cost reduction that get played in modern. So, John's idea behind playing a card like Jace Memory Adept is that once it's in play, if he's able to untap with that, he's going to be drawing two cards a turn. He's going to be able to completely, essentially, lock his opponent out of the game. And once he has, you know, just an abundance of answers, an abundance of resources at the ready, he can use it as a win condition. So just to confirm, I know we've had zero on the clock. That was the round clock within the feature match area. But because these players moved from the back table onto a front table so we could get them on camera, they got a little bit of extra time. Um, so the reason you haven't seen dice appear yet for extra turns, that's why they are moments away, um, I believe, from those extra turns. Okay, so... Um, Matt Scherer uh, actually has played a card from the sideboard, um, Bitter Blossom. Now, we're, this is not a tribal deck, so <laughs> the fairy tribe is kind of intruding on the uh, like a, a yep. affinity situation. Yeah, that uh, orange dice with the one, that is your extra turns. Um, so we're going to pass back to John George, who obviously cannot win this, but can Matthew Shearer? He's going to have two more goes at it. This is turn two. Oh, I believe turn two now uh, for George, not turn one. Okay. So it looks like John George is starting to get aggressive with his Jace Memory Adept. Um, I'm not sure how many cards Matthew Scherer has left in his oh. library, but um, John George could be attempting to win the game within the available window by decking Matthew Scherer. Okay, this is turn one, by the way, just to had confirmed uh, down on the floor. So if Matt, when the turn started, had 30 or less he's, uh, cards in his deck, uh, the Jace should be able to race that. But 
the game doesn't look like it's gone so long that that would be the case. I, mean, I guess 30, 33 cards because of, uh, because of the draw steps. So John George, if he's going to win with decking, probably needs a little help. Yeah, probably needs some card that's going to make Matthew Sherrod draw a card also. Cryptic command. Go away. Okay. Matt plays another Mox Opal, but it is a legendary artifact, so it, uh, the original one had to go bye-bye. Now, another important thing to note here is the Bitter Blossom out of Matthew Sherrod's sideboard. That would have been a really, really powerful play early in the game against this Just Guy Control deck because it would have really stretched their removal thin and uh, put them on the back foot. But drawing it this late in the game, it's uh, unlikely to uh, have the desired effect. So John George activates the Mill 10 ability of Jace Memory Adept. Now, John George, like... Uh, He's using a card from uh, Ixalan in his deck. Uh, search for Azkanta. And, well, actually, right now it's the Azkanta, su the, the Sunken Ruin. How, like, does that change how, like, this control deck works now? Absolutely, because it kind of provides you with another win condition. Even though it doesn't win the game by itself, it... Uh it provides such an avalanche of card advantage and selection over the course of time that it becomes nearly impossible for your opponent to win. So Shira has an itch champion. We're in the absolute dying rights of this round. There's turn five. Now, John George needs to win the game this turn, and he can't even like allow Matt to have another turn like to get the draw step to draw because that's it. We're no. out of turns. There is no turn six. So if Jean is to win, he's going to have to probably make <laughs> Matt draw, let's say, <laughs> 12 <laughs> cards. It's spot on. Yes. Very good. <laughs> well or done, yeah, He needs the 13th card, I guess. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I guess there could be... <laughs> I don't know of a card that says target player draws 13 cards. And it looks like John George is showing his hand and saying, I don't have a card that does that either. But uh, he's... So we'll confirm down on the floor uh, that, that, that this was a draw. Because sometimes when you show, show hands like that, it's like, hey, look, I would have won. Or, no, I think I would have won. And sometimes someone says, hey, you know what? I know you would have done. They have announced a draw. Um, so uh, Matthew Shearer and John George uh, not uh, ending up with a draw. 